Hey everyone, it's Pacific. If you like the show and you like what we do, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. It's the best way to help our show reach new listeners. And if you really, really like the show, consider becoming a member. For just $5 a month, you can get early and ad-free access to not only Out of Place, but other Midnight Disease shows like The Theater of Tomorrow, The Hotel, and, arriving next week, Margaret's Garden. All this and much, much more at midnightdisease.net slash join. And without further ado, this week's episode. I was a few minutes late getting to the Carruthers Institute this morning. Miss Arundel tutted at me when I walked in, doing that pursed lips thing she does. I think it's her version of the selfie face. I told her I got there on the bus and she called me a naughty boy. I wasn't too keen on getting caught up in that conversation, so I said something about having to get on with cataloguing a box of Tudor nails and headed down into the archives. I got the bus because I had to see Lola off at school. She's Mike's niece. His sister Abby died recently and her father raises her now and he had to head off somewhere for a week for work. So me and Mike are looking after her. That sort of crept up on me. Suddenly we're looking after a 13 year old girl. I thought, that's couples stuff isn't it? I didn't say so out loud but Mike got the vibes off me, of course he did. It happened so quickly and I don't know what to think about it. I haven't had that conversation with Mike yet. He seems to believe I'll go with the flow and we'll all be inviting neighbours round for fondue and cocktails before we know it. But I'm not so sure. Anyway. Lola got dropped off at school by her other uncle and I got in late. I forgot all about that when I saw the box waiting for me in the archives. It had been brought down via the freight elevator before I arrived. It was a knee-high wooden crate with the Carruthers Institute's address on a label stuck to the lid. A package on the top had an envelope taped to it, so I picked the package up and felt it had the shape and weight of a brick. The envelope contained a piece of paper which read, For the attention of the head archivist. It was signed, Mr Havisham. The same Mr. Havisham who had sent me a stream of these items, presumably so I could archive them among all the other thousands of potsherds and medieval nails in the Institute's archives. I turned back to the package I'd taken out of the crate. I unwrapped it and saw it was a chunk of grey stone. Limestone, I'd guess. It was from a larger piece that had been broken and it had the remains of carved lettering, but I couldn't read it. It wasn't English. At first I thought it was a gravestone, but it was much bigger than that. There were eight large pieces of stone in the crate along with dozens of smaller ones. I assembled them on the floor of my office, which took some doing. It was a very heavy jigsaw puzzle where the edges didn't all line up properly. In the end I had a carved stone slab, six feet high and two and a half feet wide. It was covered in inscribed lettering. It looked like it had been broken up deliberately. The smaller parts had been splintered off impact points, as if the slab had been attacked with a sledgehammer. The inscriptions were in an alphabet I didn't recognise at first, but there wasn't much doubt about what the language was when I saw the Star of David at the top of the slab. Unfortunately, I don't read Hebrew, but there isn't a shortage of people in London academia who can. 
I took a couple of photographs of the assembled slab and sent it to some likely-looking professors at the London School of Jewish Studies. I made up a story about the slab being found in the cemetery. I was still guessing it was some kind of grave marker, one that had been deliberately destroyed. It wouldn't be the first Jewish gravestone smashed to pieces by dickheads with sledgehammers. I got a reply after lunch. I hadn't expected one to come so quickly, or at all, to be honest. But after a couple of hours typing up a handful of Roman roof slates, there it was, from a Professor Fenton, who thanked me for my interest in such a subject and professed curiosity at the slab's origin. He attached his translation and asked me for more information about the slab and where it had been found. I still haven't thought of how I should reply. The language was indeed modern Hebrew. It read, In memory of the 73 souls who died here at Golders Green, 14th January 1889. For the crimes of Kosminski, all have suffered. Golders Green seemed a logical place for a Jewish memorial to be, since it's one of the prominently Jewish areas of London. Except, as it turns out, it wasn't a particularly Jewish area of London until after the Second World War. Most of the Jews in London then were in the West End, where the synagogues had been established, although thousands more emigrated from Russia after pogroms there in the 1880s. I'd guess you could have found Jews anywhere in London in 1889, although 73 seems an awful lot to die in one place, even in a place where lots of them lived. It seemed a lot of people to die anywhere, regardless of religion. I don't remember any Golders Green disaster or massacre, and a quick search showed no great loss of life happening in Golders Green or anywhere else in London at about the right time. In our timeline, at least. I'm still struggling with the names I should give things. On the floor of my office was a memorial to an event that didn't happen in our world's history. It happened, I'm sure of that. It remembered real people who died real deaths. They just happened to be somewhere else. A different Golders Green in a different London. Then there was Kosminski. The wording of the memorial didn't seem to indicate it was Kosminski who killed the victims, but that he was somehow responsible for them in another way. Whether it was an accident, an epidemic, or of deliberate killing, I couldn't tell. But just as it wasn't the first Jewish grave marker to be smashed up, these 73 people certainly wouldn't have been the first Jews murdered en masse. Or the last. A tragedy from another history, then. Another relic sent by the project from a world that differs from ours. I wondered, not for the first time, if these objects were all sent from the same world or from different ones. Maybe the project got them from all sorts of different timelines, maybe only one. Maybe the project itself existed in one of those timelines. The possibilities are so numerous it hurts to think about them. I looked at the date again. 1889 rang a bell, or rather 1888 did. I followed one of those weird hunches and found there was a Kosminski in London in 1889, an Aaron Kosminski. He was a Polish Jew who emigrated to London in the 1880s and worked in the East End before he was put in an insane asylum in 1891. His notes stated he was paranoid and heard voices and was admitted after threatening his sister. He's also suspected of being Jack the Ripper. Someone who either hated women or was completely crazy murdered five women in Whitechapel in autumn 1888. They might have killed more, no one's sure. They killed quickly and dismembered the bodies at leisure, what profilers today would call a product killer, who murders because they want the body for some reason. The killer took parts of the bodies away when they could. They were named Jack the Ripper after the signature on a letter sent to the Central News Agency in September, but it's probably a fake written by a journalist. Nevertheless, the killer has been called Jack the Ripper ever since. 
Aaron Kosminski was a suspect at the time of the killings, mainly because he was a poor crazy bastard who was put into an asylum just after the murders stopped. A lot of people are obsessed with solving the murders. Even though it's impossible to do 130 years after they happened, and those people still think Kosminski is a pretty decent suspect. Aaron Kosminski didn't murder 73 people in Golders Green, but he didn't have to. I imagined what would have happened if the police in 1888 had decided they had a suspect likely enough to accuse publicly of being Jack the Ripper, maybe even put on trial. And what would happen if that suspect was Jewish? We like to imagine an anti-Jewish pogrom is the sort of thing that happens in other countries. We English don't go in for that sort of barbaric business. But I don't think it's very far beneath the surface. It definitely wasn't in London in 1888, where thousands of Jews who spoke a different language and followed a different religion had flooded into London. People today are quick enough to whinge about immigrants stealing their jobs, whether that's actually what's happening or not. I hate to think what it was like in the 1880s, fueled by the sort of newspapers that would invent letters from a serial killer to pump up circulation. Jews have been pretty much illegal in Britain until the 18th century. There was a riot against Jews in the Welsh town of Tredegar in 1911. It wouldn't have taken much of an inciting event to kick off a massacre of Britain's Jews. An event like an immigrant Jew being publicly named as the first serial killer of the mass media age. I have no idea if Aaron Kosminski was Jack the Ripper. He didn't have to be. All that mattered is that the people of London thought he was. Golders Green wasn't even a Jewish area at the time, but 73 people died there because of what Aaron Kosminski did, or what everyone believed he did. How many died elsewhere? There were tens of thousands of Jews in London. In a London where memorials like the one in my office were common, there might be far, far fewer. Somebody smashed the memorial. I couldn't tell whether it had been destroyed soon after it had been set up or was broken more recently. I could almost feel the hatred radiating off it. Britain is supposed to be a tolerant and enlightened place, but how far away are we from doing the sort of things we like to think only other countries do? I wrapped the sections of the memorial up and stored them under the shelving. The day was over by then. Mike had texted me to say he'd picked up Lola from school and was playing computer games with her. I had an overwhelming desire to hug her and tell her this is a good world and that we just notice the bad things more than the good because they're so scary and we all want to be safe. I doubt I will. I'll just say hi and ask her how her day at school was and then stumble over my words because I have no idea how to speak to a teenage girl. Perhaps she picks up vibes like her uncle does. I hope so. I've only known the girl for two days and already I want her to live in a better world. I wish I knew how to make that happen. I feel like all the artefacts the project sends me are things to keep her safe from. Or maybe warnings about how the world might turn out if we're not careful. A road map, even, about how things might go wrong so we can avoid the worst of them. A strange thing to take hope from, I suppose, but we find it where we can. For now, I'll just smile at Lola and help her with her homework. I'll keep her safe from the horrible things stacking up on the shelves in my office. If I'm lucky, if I do things right, she'll never know. Out of Place was created by Ben Counter. Sound design was done by Pacific S. Obadiah. If you like this show, consider checking out other Midnight Disease productions, like The Theater of Tomorrow, The Hotel, Lake Clarity, 
SCP Archives, and Margaret's Garden.